Servants Heart. Servants Heart. Welcome to the podcast. Inspiration, motivation, take. Servants Heart. Listen to the podcast. We're all about to talk about life. Our guests will share their life story. We want you to success in life and business. We're ready and we will start shortly. We're gonna talk about life. We're going to speak on business. You're gonna shine bright. We are going to witness business with our servants' hearts. Servants heart. With hosts Steve Ramon and Ray. Ramona. Inspiration, education, talks. Welcome, everyone, to Doing Business with the Servants Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Ramona. I am so thrilled to have you join us today. This podcast is dedicated to exploring the idea of doing business and living life with a purpose. We're going to add a sports theme to this, and I'm, I'm so excited because you all know I love sports. We believe that when we approach our work, our lives with a servant's heart, we can truly make a difference. We created this show for you because we want everyone to be motivated, inspired, and educated to make an impact in your world. While you're listening to this incredible guest, Coach is going to blow you guys away with some of the stuff he's going to tell you. I want you to think about who you're going to serve today, how you're going to do it, and what impact you're going to create today. And the key word there is let's do it today. Let's not wait. And today's episode is proudly sponsored by an incredible partner, Pantheon Alliance. Imagine being part of an exclusive community of high income, successful business owners, and entrepreneurs from very diverse industries. Together, we're building a thought leader platform to make an impact and change in the world. So impact. You see all these different things I talk about in the monologue. Got coach here. He's been coaching high school football for 50 years. And we were just talking about the bridge between sports and business and sports and life. We may get into that too. It all works the same. And he's out speaking around the country and coaching people about this. Coach Phillip, welcome to the show. Well, Steve, thank you. It's a great honor for me to be on the show with you. Thank you. And I got to say this out in public to the world. I'm so envious. I always wanted to be a football coach. I still may be. I'm 63. I'm still young. I still probably will do it, but I'm envious of your 50 years and what you've done. With that being said, let's talk about the story of, of one of your players who got paralyzed and what happened. Yes, I, I'd, I'd be glad to do that. But, but, you know, before I get into that, one of the things that attracted me to you and your podcast, uh, we, we kind of had a mutual acquaintance, but was the title of it about servant and, and servant leadership and, and the things that we can do in our professions to help other people. And for what I do in coaching, that that's servanthood. And uh, as soon as I learned that, and we could talk a little more about this later, that's what we all want. Because when you find your purpose, when you get your uh, meaning in life, you realize that that's our main purpose in life is to serve others. And I think I found a great platform uh, mm -hmm. for service in the coaching profession. But the thing that uh, Steve and I were talking about, you know, briefly before coming on, and we'd shared this story before, when I first started coaching as a head coach, it was 1976. It was my second year as a head coach. I was 26 years old and <laughs> didn't have a clue, really. I was <laughs> feeling my way, just, just getting started. And our team was on our way to the school's first district championship. Uh, it never happened in history. Everything was going good. We were favored to win. And I still remember that cool October night very vividly. And we jumped up to a, a 14 to nothing lead. We kicked off. And I looked across the side of the field. One of my players was lying face down on the far sideline. And Steve, I started walking across the field at that time. And I just got this sick, sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. And I don't think I've ever felt that way before. I, I, I hope I never do again. I probably no one else does. But I, I just knew this young man was hurt badly. And it was that, that feeling of fear that comes up in you. And as I got to his side, he was saying, Coach, I can't move. I can't move. And, you know, he was taken from the field by ambulance. And we continued with the game winning easily. But I got a call in the middle of the night and said, Stewart was paralyzed from the neck down. And, you know, these kind of things happen. I mean, they happen in sports. They happen 
walking down the sidewalk. I mean, just uh, uh, things happen in life. But for our community, for our school, for our team, for me, that you know, we're a rural area. It was a close knit community. And boy, that was that was tough. That was really tough. And not only did it affect Stuart, but it affected me. I considered. I don't think I ever took the step, but it crossed my mind. I don't know if I can walk back out there and coach another year. I don't know if I want to take a chance on this happening again. So I had to overcome some fear. But I watched Stuart, and he. He had this amazing attitude of overcoming his adversity and being able to become the success that he was. And he went on and uh, married. He had a daughter. He found the Lord. He uh, had a job and just had a tremendous life about him. And it's just a remarkable story of a young man, a bunch of guys, a team, and a community that overcame adversity and went on and had success, not only in uh, Stewart's life, but in the, the players that were surrounded with him, uh, my life, the impact it had, but what it led to and so many positive results. And I think that's the thing you take away from this, even though it was a negative, that it, it ended up being a very positive thing. Yeah, and there's more of the story about his brother. Talk about that, because I think that's a, a personal and business lesson as well. Oh, it is. Uh, his brother was following him. He was maybe three or four years behind. It was a sophomore at the time in high school. And Stephen wanted to play. And his parents let him play. And I always thought that was remarkable because, you know, you have a son who's had that kind of injury. You've got that, well, I, I can't allow this to, I, I don't want to take a chance on my younger son this happening to. And I remember Stephen telling me, he said, uh, that basically told his mom and dad, he said, you can't keep me in a room the rest of my life. You've got to let me get out there and do the things that I want to do. And he's gone on. He had a great career. He passed away sometime in the last couple of years. Uh, but shortly, I don't know, Stuart was probably 15 years ago, but uh, just in the last couple of years. But he had a great career in business, doing the things that he wanted to do. But I, I firmly believe that these parents were great examples who were willing to let their children fail, willing to take a risk, maybe of injury. But because of that, they were able to be successful in their lives and steer especially with some very tough circumstances. Yeah. And, and I think his flourishing as a human being after the injury I think that probably helped the parents' decisions like, hey, this wasn't an end-all, be-all. He could still be a great human, which he became. And, and he certainly did. He, he stayed in touch. Here's the word of the story. He called, uh, I don't know, he at the end of every season, especially if we had a good season, he would call and say, hey, Coach, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. And he said, well, I, I want you to know something. He said, I've lived four years past what I'm supposed to based on his injury and so forth. He said, I'm a, I'm a walking mirror, even though I'm sitting in a chair. And he went on to say, he said, I just want you to know that I don't have any regrets. He said, I have done everything I wanted to do. I've lived a great life. You know, he talked about his marriage, about finding Jesus, about having a child and being able to work and just have a great life. He said, I just want you to know that. He said, I wish that it had happened at the end of my high school career. He said, I wish I'd been able to finish my season. And then he asked the question, and this is about impact. This is not just for coaches, but this is for people that have an impact on other people. He said, I want to ask you a question. He said, coach, do you, do you think I would have been a good player? And by the time he finished that question, tears are streaming down my cheeks. And I know they were his too, because I could answer. I may have been the person that could answer. And I said, yes, Stuart, you were going to be a great player. And he was. And then four weeks later, he passed away. Gosh. And I'm so glad we had that conversation before that, because I'm sure that's a question any athlete, especially, would want to know after an injury. Was I going to be any good? Yeah. And I could answer that honestly and say, yes, Stuart, you were. What a gift you gave him. 
coach. What a great gift. I, great story. I, I, I want to move on. It's, it's going to be hard for me because it's being in sports and stuff. It's really hit me. But let's talk about you've been very successful, extremely successful, but you've also lost. You've not been successful every season. What lessons have you learned? What have the kids that you're serving, which bless you for doing that, have learned in their personal life and they're going to eventually be business life? Because you're doing 50 years. A lot of these athletes that you work with are now adults in business. Yes, a lot of them have retired. That says a little bit about my my age. <laughs> I'll talk with them. Well, I'm retired, coach. And I said, man, oh, right, what am I doing here? Yeah. But uh, it's, it's always great to talk with them. And as, as I mentioned to you, we're having a 100-year reunion at Belfry. Not too many schools have been in existence 100 years, let alone had football 100 years. So we're very unique in that respect. But uh, yeah, the great lessons that I've learned, I think, in, in my career, and I think it's served me very well, have been persistence and patience. And I am naturally impatient. My wife will be the first to tell you that. <laughs> I want things, I want them right now. But I also realize that when you're developing young men, when you're developing leaders, whether it be coaches or people coming up in your business, that you can only take them so far, so fast at any particular time. And you've got to be patient to allow whatever it is that they're doing to pay off. We had a season, this was in 2010, and we had a pretty good football team, and we made it to the state championship game. Lost terribly. We got beaten pretty bad by a city school, one of those big schools in the city. And the next year, our team was determined to get back. And we got back to the state championship game, same team, lost again in the last minute of the game. I think the score was 15 to 14. And they were heartbroken. The next year, we're back again, same team. And we lose again in overtime. Now, a lot of these guys were freshmen. And they've talked with me since then. But you ask about lessons, about being persistent, and you don't always get what you want the first time you ask for it. It takes a little time. But they persisted and set a goal for themselves that senior year that they weren't going to be denied. And that year, we again, we made it back to the state championship game, and we won in a snowstorm, blizzard, ice, three to nothing. But we won. And I still remember hugging our starting quarterback, and we both had tears in our eyes because he was so instrumental in our victories and leadership and those things. And he said, we did it. We did it. And then that led to a four-year run of championships. We had to get that one over the hump. We'd, we'd won a couple before then. But that was a real tough series there where you just kept getting so close and a lot of people would just fall off, but this group just kept coming back. And then the group after them kept coming back and we just kept getting better and better over a period of time. But if there's two things that I would hang my hat on in coaching, it's those two things, just being persistent, getting a little better each day is my MO. That's what I tell our players. And the second thing is just being patient. You just got to give it time. And things have a way of coming around for you if you keep pouring the right things into your life and the right things into other people's lives. Yeah, and you instilled, I can see some of these players at a company in sales going, I had a bad, bad month this month, next month. It'll be a little better next month. And then the fourth month, they're the top sales guy in the company. Same parallel. Close, close, close. And you finally want it. Sales, sell. I'm top sales guy. That's the bridge I love that you're presenting there what inspires you to work with these kids well i think it's it, it's all about purpose it's mm -hmm. something that you know deep down inside that you're making a difference you're making a difference in their lives and i've always thought a person you can have a job you can go in every day you can make a few dollars and you can live a pretty good life but when you have a calling and you know it comes from the inside then you've got something that not everyone has. I, I would uh, encourage everyone to look in, inward and find out what it is that really turns you on. What is it 
that you can do that makes a difference in other people's lives that blesses you. And when you can find that, you can live a, what I call a victorious life, a championship life. Because every day there's expectation of making a difference in someone's life. And for me, my, my vehicle, my purpose is with young people, with coaches. Now, with adults, sure. I, I work with my coaches. I work with teachers at school. I speak different places. I do leadership trainings, you know, all those different things. I love working with adults as well. But my primary mode is through coaching. That's why I've done it for 50 years. And I know that's what it is for me. I always wanted to be a high school coach, and that's that's my genre of coaching. And I've stayed right with it, and I have been fortunate. I've, I've been very successful, but it took a long time for that success to transpire. I had to have some persistence. I had to have some patience before it kind of followed through and, and became some of the things that you hear about today. Especially with the tragedy of your second year of coaching, you could just walk out going, hey, this happened to Stuart, and like, not be persistent. He's going to be okay and move forward. You could just, and nobody would have blamed you. They said, I quit. I'm done. It's, I can't handle this. You'd still be a great person, but you took it to the next level. That's why you're a servant's heart. What makes a great, successful football coach? I think a person that has the, the kids' interests at heart. And I think that's true in business or in your family and everything. Coaching, to me, leadership is about relationships, number one. If you can communicate to other people that you are sincerely interested in them. I ask our kids a lot, especially those that are having some issues. <laughs> uh, one of my first questions is, how can I help you? And they're, they're sometimes taken aback. Well, they don't even know how to answer that. And I said, well, here's what's going on. And I, I just need to know what I can do to help you become your best version of yourself. And we get into some things like that. But I think when you can look at the big picture of what you're trying to do uh, as a high school football coach and keep that, even though you're going to work your kids hard, you're going to practice hard, you're going to get after them, push them to a, a different level. Because I think each one of us, there's more in us than, than maybe we realize. And that's where mentors and coaches come in play. Just like a coach on a football field is going to push his players to go one more step, take one more uh, drive on your block, uh, do, do one more rep, whatever it may be, to become a little better. I think that's where uh, private mentors, private coaches, which I do a little bit of that as well, help the person move forward in their lives that there's more in them than what meets the eye. So with, with that being said, and back to your original question, what it takes to be a great coach is you have to have the interest of that other person at heart. And in coaching, you have to have the interest of the entire team. You have to balance those things. But every individual has to know that you care about them. I, I like that. And there's a parallel to business audience. If you're listening, you're probably feeling the parallel. It's the same thing. You have a team of sales, you're coaching them. You're just not doing football. You're doing sales or whatever product or service. I love that. I have a unique question that just came to my head. Have you ever been wrong in front of your players and tell them guys, I was absolutely wrong or however you answered that. <laughs> more, more often than not. Yes. Uh, I do that frequently. And I, yeah. I'll tell our guys many times, I said it after a game in particular, uh, I may say, I don't think I did a good job for you tonight. I wasn't at my best. Uh, maybe we didn't prepare as well during the week. We thought something that didn't work out that way. We didn't adjust right. That's on me. All right. So we're going to come in Monday and I'll promise them I'll be better next week. Now you've got to join me with that. You, you've got to promise me you're going to be better. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take credit for this. I, I take credit for losses many times. And I, I'm not one of these coaches that comes in and blames players, points the finger. And that's not, that's not anything I want our players to do either. We don't want to blame officials. We don't want to blame the weather. But we certainly don't want to blame each other. And I think as a leader, sometimes you need to take that responsibility and say, hey, this is on me. We weren't prepared. I didn't yeah. do a good job getting you ready to perform. 
And too many times we want to point the finger and say, well, this guy didn't do this or this player didn't do this. And I'll ask our coaches, I said, but who's responsible for getting them to do the right thing? Well, that's us. And maybe we we got to do a little better job teaching and so forth. So, yes, uh, I'm pretty quick to accept quite a bit of blame, and I'll, I'll say it publicly. And I like – the reason I wanted to ask that is because you're talking 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds. Still, they're they're a little wonky, I guess is the word. They're still growing, maybe uh, rebels. But you could tell them, hey, I made, like you said, they don't approach it like, okay, I can take advantage of the coach. They approach it. They're going to respect you more and work harder. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah even, even though they're young kids and sometimes you can almost treat them that way. But yeah. overall, uh, they're young adults. And if you want them to respond right, you've got to treat them just like you would if you're working with a group of adults. The same same way, same principles in leadership with a group of uh, business people, a team that you're working with is no different than working with a group of athletes. And it, yeah. the similarities are unbelievably real when you start digging into it. Yeah, you're showing it today. It's if you're a business owner out there, an entrepreneur. These are great lessons. Even if you don't have a team, you're working with somebody, and that's the servant's heart. You can always approach it with respect and authenticity and being genuine. You know, don't I can't think of the word, but the other thing in sports that I've learned, I want you to talk about is team. How to work with players is no different than you got a company of 100 employees or I partner up with somebody. We're always working with people. How does sports, and especially football, teach these kids working together? Well, I think the the, the biggest thing that, that we try to do is, number one, we say, is you got to be willing to give a little bit of yourself to the team for the team to succeed. And that doesn't take away from your individuality. Everyone's different. You got a quarterback, you got a fullback, you got an offensive lineman. So everybody's got their own skill set. But for the team to operate smoothly, you got to give up a little bit of yourself. We, we, we're pretty direct about it. You got to give up a little bit of your ego, your own your own goals, for the team to succeed. Because when the team succeeds, then your own goals are probably going to be met at a higher level than if you do it yourself. For instance, if we play in a state championship game, we're a rural area. We don't get the news media like a big city would. You know, we don't have all those TV stations and things. We've got one local that's about two hours away. So that's where <laughs> we are. But we play in a state championship. All of a sudden, we've got the news media surrounding us. The chances of us having an all-state player or two or three go up um, uh, immensely but we have to play as a team to get there but then the individuals get recognition because of the success of the team and that's the same thing in a business situation if you're in sales and and the whole sales team performs exceptionally well then you get recognized as the team but the individuals now will be recognized because they've done exceptionally well not because two or three did because if two or three do well, the team might not get recognized and no one hears about, about that at all. Yeah. So our goal has always been the team concept. And we spend a lot of time just talking about this. So this is, this is how you get recognized as an individual. And we're pretty direct about it. So if we talk about ego, we talk about putting others first, what it takes to really be successful. Yeah. I, I've got a little thing. I watch football. I always look at the snapper the holder and the kicker, especially the snapper and the kicker, put way down the line. But I watch them. If they're running to their huddle, they're aggressive, their energy, mm -hmm. if they're going to do it, everybody, because they're not getting any notoriety at all. Guy snapping the ball, he's getting destroyed. And I, yeah. I like looking at that because that really kind of gives the culture of the, of the team. We're running out of time here. We're getting close. Um, talk about your book. I love your book how you take sports and business. Talk about what you're doing and the mission of it. Well, the mission of my book, actually both of my books, uh, the first one, a family of football, I put it off probably for 10 years. It was almost mm. like a risk that I wasn't ready to take, even though I'd had many people say, you, you need to write a book. 
because you've had experiences that most coaches don't have. One of those being the incident that I shared with you about Stewart and how that affected you, how that affected your career and the impact it had. And uh, two or three other things that have happened in my career. So I, I said, okay, I'm going to do this. But I did put it off a while, because even after people had asked. The second book, uh, Climb the Mountain, I was much more intentional about. I said, I think I've got some ideas on leadership, on coaching, and becoming the, the best version of yourself. And I was much more uh, directive and in an order, I guess. I think the second one's really better. They say by the time you finish your book, uh, you'll realize it's not as good as you thought it was to begin with. But I know the second one's better than the first one, and it gives more details on vision, uh, communication, leadership, and some of those technical skills that are related not only to sports, but it relates to business. And it's, I kind of finish up with purpose. Yeah. And anybody listening, if you're a coach, you don't need to be a football coach. This is all translatable to any sport, whether you're teaching tennis, coaching tennis, golf, football, it doesn't matter. You're, you're still working with young kids and following these principles will make a difference. Um, got a fun question for you, F Coach Phillip. You have a restaurant, you have a reservation in a restaurant in Belfair, four, four top, four seats. You're sitting in one seat, in the other three seats, dead or alive. Why would, you know, who would you invite and why? And more importantly, what food would you order? Oh, man. <laughs> hey, you're, you're laying it on me right now. I am. <laughs> four, four seats. Um, I, I'll tell you one, one seat I, I would invite, and that would be my former mentor. He passed away about 15 years ago, but I knew him for 38 years, and he taught me immeasurable life lessons, not only about coaching football, but about business. I got into real estate because of him, and I did not know the first thing about it till I met him. But he kind of guided me into that. So he was a great mentor for me. And I'd love to be able to sit down and just talk with him again about where I am today. Because that's been, gosh, that was back in 2009, 2010. Wow. I think that would be one person for sure. Um, uh, after that, I, I don't know if I can really choose certain people to, to sit down with. Sure. Because uh, I, I read quite a bit. I read a lot of books. And even though I might not be in the room with that person, I kind of feel like I know that person and don't know if I would need to sit sit with that person specifically. Yeah, I do think sometimes that uh, people say, well, you'll find these things out when you get to heaven. But I think it's a guy by the name of Paul in the Bible would be a very interesting person to talk with. Because yeah. he, he's got some stories. And you talk about a guy that persevered and was very persistent, uh, overcoming adversity, those kind of things. I just kind of like to see maybe what he had to say. But there's there's a, there's a couple of people yeah. maybe right there. What would I order? Well, it almost depend on the restaurant. But if I just had to stay one, I'd get a medium rare steak uh, with a salad and baked potato, maybe some asparagus. I was hoping you would say that. I'm getting <laughs> close to lunch here, so I think I might have a steak for lunch. No, that's awesome. Uh, Thank you so much, Coach. But before we leave, how can people reach out to support you uh, and find you? Well, I have a, a Facebook page, and I'll, I'll say that I'm not real active on it. I check it from time to time. My wife does a little more on that, but it's just under Philip Haywood. I've got a Philip Haywood and Associates, too, a kind of a business page. But my email, and you might be able to put that on the screen sometime, Philip Haywood underscore Belfry at hotmail.com uh, that's my personal email and if you were uh, interested in a signed book or you wanted me to speak or just talk with you maybe coach or work with you in some form or fashion you can send me an email at that address and i'd be glad to uh, speak with you on whatever topic it may be but the both books are available on amazon and signed books you'd have to contact me personally We'll put all the information in the show notes so they have access. If you don't have access there, reach out to me. I'll connect you with Coach. Uh, I, I plan on thinking we're going to work together. I just love his attitude, and he's got you got me fired up to coach. So I, I'm going to reach out to a couple of schools that reach out to me and hopefully make sure I make it happen. And good luck on your season. Keep me 
up to date how you're doing. I, and I'll try to find you online and see how you're doing. And I want to thank you so much for being on. You're, you're a blessing to the, the sport of football. Well, thank you, Steve. It's been a great honor, as I said earlier, privilege to be able to be on your show. Amen. Thank you. And don't forget, comment on the YouTube channel, comment on the podcast when it's out in a couple months. You know, leave me some critique. Tell us good or bad what you learned. Or if you want to reach out to Coach, just let me know. Again, get the book. We'll have the Amazon stuff uh, links in there as well. Uh, don't forget my TV show, Together We Serve, uh, every Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and, you know, subscribe. I've got many great guests like Coach Phil. You might want to go back and listen again. There might be some things you learned. So go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel and have access to all these great guests that are coming out that I'm so blessed to have. And me and Coach, thank you so much for listening or watching to this podcast. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Doing Business and Sports with a Servant's Heart. See you all soon.